Good afternoon. Now to discuss the extraordinary film Mind Game and build on its themes, Real Abilities Los Angeles welcome you, welcomes you to our panel discussion, Sports and Mental Health, Expanding the Disability Lens. We're joined by Mind Game filmmaker Rick Goldsmith, Paralympian and Disability Commissioner Candace Cable, founder of Crip Hop Nation and Paralympian Leroy F. Moore. Now, please welcome yourself, welcome the Real Abilities team, Los Angeles, the discussion of mind game. Rick, I'm going to throw it right to you to start telling us about the, making this extraordinary film that we've just all seen and are all, all moved by. Um, how I got into the film is usually the first question I get. And um, I had seen an article in the New York Times, which you actually saw in the film, written by William Roden, about Shamiqua Holdsclaw. And I, I knew of her because actually my best friend from uh, growing up was Lon Babby, who was also in the film and was Shamiqua's agent. So I had an in and I asked uh, Lon to introduce me to Shamiqua. I thought it would be a great entree into the issue of mental illness and stigma and what's not being done about it and what could be done about it. So he hooked us up by email introduction, and then um, I spoke with Shamiqua over the phone. And one of the first questions she asked me was, you know, why you, why this subject, why me? Uh, you know, why me, Shamiqua, why would you want to do a film about me? And I explained to her that I have uh, some mental illness in my family. My uncle was a uh, schizophrenic, kind of lifelong schizophrenic, and he had just died recently. So he was on my mind quite a bit. And my own teenage daughter, uh, had severe mental health uh, struggles. So it was really close to my heart and um, that's how we got into it. Um, it took a little bit of a while for, you know, she had to get to know me and she said, um, you know, we have to meet each other. And I got a crew together and I said, why don't I fly down to Atlanta where she was living? I'll have a crew standing by, we'll have dinner together. And if it checks out, we'll get into it. So anyway, that's a, that's a longer story, but she okayed it and we were off and running. Well, uh, and this, is, uh, this is Candace, uh, yes. Candace Paywall. And I, I, I wanted to, to jump in and um, and I, I know Lero, you could introduce yourself afterwards, but um, I was a, a Paralymp, um, I'm a, I wanted to do an audio description first and, and, um, and uh, let everybody know, I'm a Caucasian woman with shoulder length, blonde, brown, silver mm -hmm. hair, and I have dark black rim glasses. My background is blurred and I have a blue sweater on and uh, my pronouns are she and her and I was a nine-time Paralympian. I had a 27-year career as a Paralympic athlete after a spinal cord injury at the age of 21 in 1975. So I use a wheelchair for mobility. And I'm really grateful to hear the catalyst because I was, I was wondering what the catalyst was to be able to create a film like this. And uh, so I'm going to toss it to Leroy. Thank you, Leroy. If you'd introduce yourself and, and tell us a little about your background. Hello, hello, I'm Leroy Moore. I'm a um, yeah, Paralympian from 1988, the Olympics in Seoul, Korea. Also an activist around disability justice. Um, also started what's called Crip Hop, and that's um, hip hop and music with people with disabilities from around the world. We just won an, M an Emmy. Also a graduate student at UCLA. And with mental health issues, I wrote my first column back in 1996 around the shooting of uh, Margaret L. Mitchell, um, a homeless lady that had mental health disability right here in LA. So I've been dealing with um, mental health disabilities and police and um, dis mental health disabilities um, since the 80s. 
And my, my thing is that um, we have to go beyond education and beyond um, awareness to really do some implementation. Thank you. Excellent. And I also see Garrison Red has joined us. He's another Paralympian. I, he's on the move, it looks like. And Garrison was uh, going to join in this call and help uh, moderate this panel and really get this discussion rolling around mental health and sports. So Garrison, <laughs> you were fine there. We just lost your image. So that said, I want to throw it back to Candice, uh, actually, and uh, talk to us a little bit about the impact of mental health on professional athletes, particularly those with disabilities. Thank yes. you. Thank uh, you for having Yeah, this, oh. is, this is Candice again. And, you know, one of the things that, Rick, that really stood out from the film was, and something that all athletes deal with is the level of internalized ableism that we have to try to push through everything, right? Because it's kind of the nature of sport is to, to constantly break down those barriers, anything that's an obstacle, we're moving through it, we're going to get past it. And, and that no. internalized, okay. yeah, exactly. And I, I saw it over and over in the film and it was, was, you know, really, really poignant. And I know the word was never actually said ableism, but um, it is a real issue in our society now around the ideas that each one of us has to um, adhere to a certain standard of health that our medical industrial complex has created, right? That we're all supposed to be in a certain space health-wise when we're we're really just a cornucopia of different levels of health conditions in different spaces. And as athletes, you know, I was looking around on the internet just recently and Lindsey Vaughn, who was an Olympic downhill skier has since re retired. She has a film call coming out this uh, next year called rise, which is about her mental health and struggles with depression during her time as a skier. And, and I think, the mental health pieces, if you already have depression or you're bipolar or something like that, and it hasn't been diagnosed, and then you layer on top of it, the piece around internalized ableism, we get this real misconception that, and Lindsey Vaughn said this, there's a misconception that athletes are superhumans. And while we do physically superhuman things, we are far from it. I think it's 10 times more isolating being an athlete than having a traditional job. Imagine going to work every day and only seeing three or four people. And, and so her conversations around it, I think your film and Shikniki's film is, is way ahead of the curve on this because those, those issues around mental health conditions coupled with internalized ableism and external ableism really, I think, creates some type of an atomic bomb for a lot of people. I, I you know, I, I think that when we, when I got into the film, it was almost 10 years ago, 2012 was when we started and it came out in 2015. And there was starting, just starting to be an awareness. And I think especially like in the NBA, people like Kevin Love and DeMar Rosen, uh, we're, we're starting to come out and we, we have, it, it's heartening on the one hand to see how we've progressed and with people like Simone Biles and Naomi Osaka kind of coming to the fore, I think the reaction to them has been, um, let's say more mature <laughs> um, than if you went back five years and yes. And athletes would be, you know, treated, oh, you're soft, oh, you're this, oh, you're that, or why are you complaining about that? Um, I would say from my own education, I was also educated in a way by my team. Um, you probably all are aware of the film Crip Camp that came out in the last year, and I think Jim Lebrecht is going to be on in a, maybe in the next panel, I'm not sure. Um, he actually did the sound design for my film. Jim and I have worked together on four or five films together and have known each other for a long time. But speaking with him both before he got into the filmmaking of Crip Camp and, and since then has opened my eyes to see the challenges of, as you say, ableism 
uh, or living in an, you know, in a world that's driven by ableism, um, that there's still so much more to do in terms of education, in terms of reducing stigma, in, the term, in, in terms of making mental health services available and acceptable, you know, according to a, uh, the AMA, the uh, ACA, you know, uh, Obamacare, it's supposed to be on par with physical treat health, uh, health treatment, but it's not in reality. And so we still have a long way to go. And that's kind of why I did the film, why I hit on, you know, why I discussed certain issues like the actual challenges that she had and the actual stigma, things that people who had mental illness it, themselves or in their family could hang on to and maybe take take the next step. Um, so anyway, I it's it's a, an honor for me to be on this panel and to help in any way possible connect those words, uh, uh, connect those worlds of disability and mental health challenges um, and show what they have in common and, and where we could go. Well, and I'd sport, to, so right? Can, if I could yeah. for a moment, I wanna make sure we get Garrison in there. Garrett, you could talk to us a little bit about stigma, disability and mental health and the work you're doing with Garrison Red Project, particularly with the youth. And so introduce yourself first to everybody. And uh, yeah. take yes, it. thank you for having me. My name is Garrison Red. I'm from Brooklyn, New York. I'm a Team USA para power lifter. I'm also the founder of the Garrison Red Project, which is a non for profit organization that I started to assist individuals with disabilities with achieving resources so they could be independent and also an author. So, with that said, um, as a elite athlete, it's a lot of stuff that goes into, you know, the preparation, um, things that go on behind the scenes, not so much the training aspect, but, you know, the, you have to financially support yourself. So with that said, you know, it's a lot of pressure. Um, some athletes have families that they are taking care of. So it could really affect your mental health in ways that, you know, we don't see as ordinary people often. So, you know, with the Garrison Red Project, I try to formulate, you know, different plans and different ways of how to structure. Because a lot of um, ways of dealing with mental health is you have to be organized. And that's one of the ways I start by, you know, just planning because things can get overwhelming at times and it could be a lot of stress on you. Leroy, talk to us a little bit about the work you're doing. I think you're utilizing sort of tactics to um, you know, get the word out there that are pretty unique in the work you're doing, particularly again with, with Crip Hop Nation. So talk to us about this space. Yeah, I want, I want to be honest and say that it, 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 it's ridiculous that we're in 2021 and the sports ring is just opening up um, mental health. That's just ridiculous. Because this opened up been here since Moses, you know? Um, <laughs> We, we had all kinds of laws. We protest, we, we shut down the Capitol. It's 2021 and we're only, not only is sports being here, also hip hop is dealing with mental health. I think the, the reason because um, the disability community is separated. You know, when you talk about disability, that's all you see is um, people in um, people that, that are wheelchair users. You know, that's that's all you see. But that's not the true vision of, of the disability community. So in 2021, um, yeah, we need to educate, but we need to go beyond that. And we need um, institutional change. Right. The sports arena is way be behind the sports arena and the music industry. Those two industries, I, I, they are way behind when you talk about disability. Because they, 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 they didn't have to talk about disability because nobody was pressing them to talk about disability. 
you know, um, I I go to music um, when, when Curtis Mayfield got disabled, you know, in his accident, he totally disappeared. Because music is like, oh, you're disabled now, here, you know, let's go on. So the same thing with the sports trainer, you know, when um, Casey Martin, the golfer, a couple years ago, was, was protesting for, to get on a golf cart, you know, for his disorder. Mm -hmm. That's it, like one year and woof, he's gone. Mm -hmm. so, so these are the, you know, institutional change that we need to have. I mean, yes, I agree about education and awareness, but we need to go deeper, especially now when we're talking about inclusionary policy and everybody's jumping on board. But we need agencies and organizations and sports arena and the music industry to really go deep into making institutional change. And, that, and that, that's the only way it's going to change. You know, we can do education until, until we're blue in the face. I'm 53. I've been educating people since I was a teen teenager. So. so how do we make that institutional change? I mean, you know, I've got filmmaker on here. I've got Paralympians on here. I've got the heads of organizations on here. You know, how do we make that kind of level change? I think you said, Leroy, right, that, that education, you know, we've been educated for a long time, but how do we really make concrete change? So you're all doing it, I, I would argue, mostly through visibility. That's a lot of the work um, you do. What else can we do to make um, that well, structural, uh, uh, structural gap? Yeah, I'll, I'll be quick. No. About, um, I'll give you an example. When Joe Biden was running for president, you know, he had a disability platform. It's the first time that um, a President King had a disability platform, which is ridiculous. But anyway, he said that he'll fully fund IDEA. IDEA is an Individual Disability Act. That act was passed in the early 70s. That act hasn't been fully funded are fully enforced since the 70s. And Joe Biden just woke up and said, like, oh, we're going to enforce it. <laughs> that's, that's the problem, people, is that our laws are not enforced. So, you know, the sports thing and music industry can go on because our laws are not enforced. We need to really finish the job of our ancestors. And I guess it was an that started to just wave away. It's like, okay, we got laws. But now we're going to enforce them. And you have to do it. If you don't do it, then you fight. Let's all do it. <laughs> yeah, and I, you know, and I would say <clears throat> to that question is that we as individuals have to understand, you know, where our rights are. When Leroy is talking about laws being enforced, like really understand that mental health conditions are protected under the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA. And oftentimes people don't want to self-identify as having a disability with their mental health conditions because they're afraid of any type of discrimination or the stigmas and stereotypes that fall into those ideas around mental health conditions. And so it's really understanding the types of ableism that we're up against in, on multiple platforms, internalized our own, as well as external ones. I mean, and really understanding what ableism is because ableism, you don't have to be disabled to experience ableism. It's a system that places value on people's bodies and minds based around a societal construct. And the definition by T.L. Lewis is fantastic because it really is about a form of systemic oppression that leads to people and societies determining who's valuable and worthy based on their language, appearance, religion, or their ability to satisfactorily reproduce, excel, that we got with our athletes, right? Excel and behave. So, and that's from T.L. Lewis. And honestly, if we reflect back on that and understand what we're up against internally and externally, because as an athlete, I remember 
when I started to realize my own internalized ableism of, I'm going to get through this. I'm going to get over this. I'm going to figure out a way to get, get past this and squash all those other feelings down so that I don't have to feel any of the fear or anxiety or any of that. I just need to get past this mark to get what I need. And as athletes, we're expendable. So a lot of times we're not willing to speak up about any kind of accommodation that we need to be able to continue to be successful because we're afraid somebody else is going to take our place. So you talked about you know, systemic problems and certainly stigma. So, so Rick, I'd love to hear from you on your take as a filmmaker and your take on Shamiqua's take uh, on, on addressing stigma. And then Garrison, after that, if you, if you could um, really talk about um, Garrison Red Project in terms of, again, how you address stigma working with uh, the, the, your constituents in, in New York would be great. Well, I think Shamiqua's story is a, a good example of kind of the three levels of stigma that that people are up against. And, um, you know, we, we, she and I talked about it and it comes out in the film. And the first is, uh, you know, I think as Candace was talking about, the first is internalized stigma and uh, which prevents people from talking about it, um, which Shamiqua went through when she first was experiencing it with the mystics. Um, and she wouldn't, she wouldn't come through even to her teammates and talk about her problems. And the second is um, kind of family or community stigma, which is um, in stigma among the people around you. People who have maybe mental illness in their families, but they're not experiencing it themselves, want to keep it hidden in the families uh, and, and not talked about. And that's something that has to be kind of addressed, normalized, made people made feel comfortable that this is not to be kept secret. Um, and then the third level is societal stigma, which is you know discrimination, discrimination in jobs, discrimination in housing. I mean, those things are very real. So that you can be very open about your um, mental illness or disability or whatever but you, we still need to find ways to organize and, um, and, and use that organization to promote change so that the actual barriers in housing and in jobs and in other ways, accommodations um, are overcome. And um, you know, as, as someone said be, before, are put into law and are enforced by um, you know, enforced in that law. Excellent. Garrison, jump in there. Yeah, I totally agree with Rick on the part where you mentioned to organize. One of the things that should occur more often within the disabled community is that individuals should showcase, you know, their capabilities. Um, you have to change the stigma so in order to change the stigma you have to show yourself as an asset and so that way the perspective of being viewed as a liability no longer occurs so with that said you know with the garrison red project we promote all the capabilities that individuals have so we don't really focus on the things they can't do but we focus on the things they can do and the things they can do at a proficient level so that's one of the things and with being an athlete as well you know, there's a stigma that that you know individuals that are disabled not true because especially in the sport of powerlifting, we typically lift more than our able-bodied counterparts in the weight classes that we compete in. Please, Leroy, can I jump in? Please. Yeah, I think we have to flip the script. Because this way is an obvious stigma. This way is a culture, it's a history, it's a way of life, it's international. And um, I was watching the movie, and one, one thing I realized is that, and I, I'm not, I'm not put, you know, putting or putting the blame on anybody, but when, when, when the grandmother said, oh, You'll go out and take your frustration out on the basketball court. That that was a missed opportunity. That was a missed opportunity of the grandma. Like, no, let's let's talk about it. 
you know, and I think one one thing that the um, black community never had is disability education because we still hold um, the slave masters thinking around disability. It's something they overcome, something to not look at, and something that don't talk about. So when I saw that, I was like, oh, that's a lost opportunity. And in, in, in seeing get therapy until she was an in, in, in adult woman, I was like, wow, you know. So, you know, compared to my parents, my parents were like right out there with disability. They put me in organizations that had you know, black disabled leaders, you know, and we talked about it. So, and that, and that changed my whole political and educational viewpoint around disability. It's not something to overcome, it's not something to, to um, be ashamed of, it's something to, to be a part of in trying to find your brothers and sisters in, in this community. So, so you yeah, have the community. That's another thing around my sports. When I did the Paralympics, my sports was only one part of my life. You know, my sports was 24 7. Other things came from the sports, but my sports wasn't the, the, the be all and end all. And I think athletes get so much pressure in sports. And once their um, career is over, they're lost because they, they, they don't know what to do. And that, and, and that you know, increases um, depression and all that stuff. And so, so I say, you know, be, have your life be full with other things, you know. And then, you know, be honest around disability mental health, you know, and yeah, it's it's not a stigma. It's 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 a it's a culture to history. And I you know I, I, I also point the finger to the disability community because you know um, we separate physical disabilities from mental health disabilities. You know, so people with mental health disabilities don't see themselves in a larger disability community. So we, we need to change that, you know, um, inside of the movement. So, so let me ask, with this, with flipping the script on disability as stigma, um, you know, we have a film that's actually coming after this panel, Campiones, and it's about uh, folks in the intellectual, um, uh, intellectually disabled uh, community. Um, the, the inclusion issue that comes up there a lot is, is, and this is a question we got from the audience, how do we support parents, particularly parents of youth in the IDD community who want to pursue athletics and are discouraged by their peers, by faculty and other adults? That's really kind of a population we haven't discussed here. How do we uh, address youth in that space and, and make sure there, there is space and organized sport for them to participate? Well, is, this a, is that question, um... Because it sounds like you're talking about intellectual disabilities and and being persons with intellectual disabilities being discouraged from participating. Right. Is that, is that right? Oh, it's, it's another place we haven't talked about in this conversation yet. Right. Well, so you know, one of the, you know, as Leroy was talking about missed opportunities, one of the missed opportunities in that is knowing what's available, right? We don't have in many instances. Uh, I know in Los Angeles here, we don't have a good list of resources that are available when it comes to sport, because I'm going to focus a little bit on sport here, and who and how people can participate depending on what their, their disability is. So in LA, there's actually programs within the Unified School District that are called Unified Sport, and it's kids with intellectual disabilities playing sport with not a non-disabled kids. And that's filtered in through the school district throughout through Special Olympics. Special Olympics created that to try to create more of a mainstream and more opportunity to have that one-on-one non-disabled disabled together and have those conversations and be able to 
break down those stigmas that Leroy was talking about, those, those pieces that those myths that people believe around disability, which are false, you know, because the essential truth is, is that each and every one of us are going to experience disability in our lives. If nothing else, age is going to bring age-related disabilities. So disability is not a bad word. It's not a, a bad thing, but not talking about it as we saw in the film, not talking about the, a mental health condition, not talking about the anger, not, not talking about the fears, not talking about the pressure, we get into trouble with that. And having opportunities to talk about it, especially with the coaches and administration staff. I mean, I personally think that there's a real missed opportunity for coaches and people who are administrating sport to require athletes to get support throughout their careers. Like, no, I don't get to choose when I want to do it is that I'm a, it's a part of the whole system, you know? And so when we talk about intellectual disabilities and the way they get separated from physical disabilities, I mean, that really started with our federal government. I mean, that started there where they're like, oh, intellectual disabilities over here, physical disabilities over here, this kind of thing. And funding was then separated like that. And then the disability community just kept going along with it, you know, and that's, that's a systemic piece that Leroy was talking about that needs to be dismantled and taken down, you know, so the lack of resources of, you know, mouth to mouth, even, you know, the person to person conversations, being able to get parents together to talk about what the needs are. Uh, I have a friend um, whose son has spina bifida and she's a part of a mom's group of kids with spina bifida. And they talk about what's not working and what's working and how they can get more resources and more opportunity for their kids to participate in everything. And one of the things is sport. But I'd like to add another piece to that. And I, um, I think the way that sports, especially youth sports, but, but competitive sports and sports leagues operate in this in this country really needs change. And, and what I mean like that is there's so much emphasis on achievement, on winning, on winning at all costs, on getting the edge, as opposed to using organized sports, which are a wonderful um, construct to teach life skills about uh, cooperation, about character building, about honoring your opponents, honoring the game. Um, there's a group that I got involved with called po Positive Coaching Alliance um, when I coached my daughter and through eight years of softball, you know, from when she was in first grade to eighth grade. Um, and, you know, they are, are not the only group, of course, but they're trying to change that approach. And I think all, all the things that, that Candace just talked about would be, um, would be able to be addressed within a different sports culture. And I think that the coaches who buy into a different construct where this is about building up uh, youth and their skills to handle life issues, that's really what, what this, the organized sports should be doing. And so to change that culture, I think is going to make all these other changes much more possible. Yeah, I totally agree with you on that because sport really hasn't and shown this through throughout Paralympic sport and other sports for peace, an opportunity to create real social change. Uh, if, it's, if it's done right, you know, we really have to be open and honest about where the issues lie. And, and one, you know, one of the issues around thinking that, that as athletes, we can control everything uh, because we're, we're, te we're teaching ourselves to control our bodies in all these different ways is a fallacy. And we come out of sports. I know I personally came out of sports. I re retired in 2006 after 27 years. And I thought the plan that I had in place was, you know, flawless. I was going to go forward. I had this idea and I, two years out, I suddenly began to realize, wow, I 
am still self-identifying as an athlete and nothing else. And what is the, you know, what is the issue here? Why am I doing this? And I put myself into counseling to be able to figure it out because it was so ingrained in me that that was all that I was. And we, we see that in the film, we see it in the film with her is that she really felt that she was nothing without sport and sport teaches us to be like that. And, and that's one of the things that we need to be able to dismantle is that sport should teach us that we are bigger than the sport, that we are bigger than all of this. And it's a part of who we are. And it's going to be an awesome platform when we're done, but it's not everything of who we are that we're bigger than that. Roy, please go ahead. So you want Yeah, I think sports in the music industry, you know, be, before now, had um, a cherry model when it comes to disability. I've seen it time and time again. Is that, you know, the music industry and sports find a lot of, of charities for people with disabilities, but don't go deep into disability rights, disability justice. They're stuck in the charity model. And that's been so outdated in such a long time. So the sports media and the music industry has to, um, you know, come up to today with disability justice and disability rights. So I think we had an audience question, um, Ajana. Yes. Um, so someone asked, uh, with the pandemic, mental health issues have surfaced among many young people, and we forget the value of physical activity in helping folks deal with mental health. And yet the pandemic has limited not only individuals, but group sports. In this current climate, accessing mental health services and therapists is challenging at best. Do you have any recommendations on how to support athletes during this period? Well, this is Candace, and I, I my first my first thought with that is that we have to stop depending on our our physical uh, attributes to be able to deal with our mental health. I know it helps, but we really have to become conscious and understand what our own bias, our own stereotypes, and and what our own beliefs are about what is a healthy mind. You know, because because there's a lot of activities that we can do that don't focus on something physical uh, because physical is one of the things that's pretty easily lost, you know, depending on what happens in your life. And I know throughout the pandemic that multiple adaptive sports organizations and one that I'm involved with Angel City Sports did things online to be able to continue to build the community feeling of belonging so that they could begin to alleviate some of the mental health conditions that were starting to surface because of isolation. Uh, isolation, whether it's internal or external, uh, you know, isolating ourselves is a problem because as human beings, we are about building community. We are about co-creation. And if we're not able to do that, then we start to get smaller and smaller and diminish ourselves in multiple ways. And, and that's, I mean, I'm not a doctor. It's just, it's things that I've read about how to build community. I'm a community builder. It's one of the things that I love to be able to see is bringing people together to talk about what's going on with them. And then how do we elevate the community? And, uh, you know, so one of the things that they were doing, um, Angel City Sports was doing during the, the pandemic were cooking classes online. And, and those classes that they were doing, everybody was talking about what was happening there, which started to elevate the conversation about how they were feeling. And, and once we're able to elevate that conversation about how we're feeling and we feel safe and we can be vulnerable, then we're gonna be able to say, okay, I need this kind of help with this, this is working for me and this is not, but it's really about staying connected to a community. I mean, I really love to know more about what Garrison's doing because when you create a, a, an organization like that, that brings your community together, it's, it really is something that 
is needed on so many levels in so many areas. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, so one of the things and one of the reasons why I created the Garrison Red Project was to highlight the abilities of individuals that are what I like to call differently abled. I don't like really using the word disabled. So what I notice is that it, people, you know, often they um, stereotyped individuals such as myself, you know, based on how our appearance and they didn't even know like, me, I'm the strongest person in the country at 130 pounds. So with that, you know, with my organization, it was about just bringing individuals from all walks of life together and create a more inclusive environment. Um, that's one of the things that people fail to realize. The only way we're going to create equality is we if we create inclusion. So by creating inclusion is I have events where I bring people out together. So you could be a CEO or you could be next to an individual that was recently injured with a spinal cord injury. And that's how communication begins, which will lead to employment opportunities and other opportunities that we overlook and, you know, we take for granted. So that's one of the goals and missions of my organization, as well as to create inclusion. I, I want to just build on what Garrison was saying about how people are seen seen differently or seen only by their ability or different ability, um, and and I think our athletic, our, our media culture and our athletic culture are joined at the hip in um, in glorifying these people for the uh, you know for the for the physical achievements that they do. And then turn away when, when those things are done. There was, a, you know, and I'll, I'll point to my own profession. There was um, a few weeks ago a PBS series of Muhammad Ali, four four parts, eight hours. It was actually well done in a lot lots of different ways, but it focused on Muhammad Ali's boxing career, which ended when he was in his late thirties, and then he got um, Parkinson's disease short, shortly after that. And he lived another 40 years. And those 40 years were incredibly productive. And he did some wonderful things. And I think one of the reasons why he's remembered with such affection today are the things that he did in those 40 years. And the filmmaker devoted about 20 minutes of eight hours um, and mostly almost pitying him because he had those shakes that are, that are characteristics of Parkinson's disease, as if to say, what a tragedy. And yet this was just part of Muhammad Ali's life that he actually accepted and did something very positive with. It wasn't like, oh, this setback and now he can't box anymore. So I think we have to start seeing, and, and, and I, I look at people like Naomi Osaka, and Simone Biles, and I see that they're, trying now to flip the script. It's not just me and what I can do on the, you know, on the parallel bars. It's me as a person and there are other things going on. And my story might have a lot to tell you that don't have to do with my, my super, you know, physical achievements. Well, so I, oh. I just, I'm going to just jump in for a second. Then I'm going to let Leroy. Um, so when I offered up the definition of ableism, I mean, Rick, you were you were demonstrating right there what that filmmaker was caught up in a level of ableism that is really focused on one piece of someone's physicality, and uh, like, no no disrespect to Garrison, but one of the issues for us as disabled people is that those euphemisms of differently abled and and saying that kind of thing really it really had so like I'm not sure how to explain it really it really kind of muddies up the waters because ableism is only based on ability and and we as people with disabilities have an identity and a pride in who we are and so disability really the term disability in the Webster's dictionary is about you know being broken and that kind of thing, redefining that with our identity and and bringing that forward 
is a critical piece of inclusion because because it's not the word's not going away and and to say that we don't identify with it then separates the society of people disabled does all of it it separates it in a big way when we're really wanting to come together as a community and i i know that um leroy mentioned that about how we are really fractioned in the community and that that piece is is a big part of it yeah thank, thank you candace it's really 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 important and i want i want to say that the uh, the Olympics should be partnering more closely with the Paralympics. You know, I, I, mm -hmm. I don't see that happening. You know, just like the NBA is now partnering with the WNBA, you know, the Women's you know, Basketball League. You know, not, not a lot. They shouldn't be partnering more. But, you know, that's, that's, that, that's the thing that... Um, it should be partnership. You know, it should not be separate. You know, since since Seoul, Korea, the Paralympics compete in the same place as the Olympics. So we should be on the same the same table. You know. But and I wanna I wanna bring up my organization again because sports has always been connected to music, been connected to their hip hop. And now this this is a great opportunity for the sports trainer, Paralympics, uh, um, Olympics, you know, post sports, plus the Olympics, it's an all partner with hip hop or other music. Um, Coalition that deals with disability it's it's it's, it's a fit. You know, we see Snoop Dogg doing commercials for NBA. You know, so it's it's a fit, and just well, let's do it. I mean, it's you know here in LA, the Paralympics and Olympics are going to be here in four years, and when what Crip Hop is doing is um, building a Crip Hop Institute where we, we, we will have a place, a physical place in LA where people with disabilities and their families can come learn about not only Crip Hop, but the history of the disability rights movement, the, the history of disability music internationally. You know, I'm a pair, I'm a, you know, I, I've been doing with the Paralympics. Now we're, you know, because Clip Out just won an Emmy for that. You know, we're, we're, we're taking that on with our work, you know, with Clip Out and music and mixing it with the sports. So, you know, people are doing it. It's just the sports arena has to partner with us. You know, there's nothing that they can do. They can partner with us because they need to be a partner first, so they can so they can be educated. You know, you can't throw charity with charity for us and just go on like you know nothing happens. You have to partner with us so we can both educate each other and both grow in our disability justice thinking, and that that will open up sports arena a lot, a lot further, especially with the Olympics coming to LA. Okay. Uh, John, I think you had another audience question. Yes, there's uh, another audience question. So it reads, um, the pendulum on winning and on simply participating is constantly swinging back and forth. How do we encourage coaches to focus on the value and importance of resilience and persevering in the face of defeat and setbacks? And I know Candace touched on that a little bit earlier um, along the lines of changing coaching. Do you want to start this one off? But I'd love to hear all around. And 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 and, and, and Rick, some of your take in working with you, yeah. some of the coaches. Yeah. Yeah. Um so 
I think that that we have to we have to reevaluate the the system, you know, the winning at all costs type of mentality. Um, and I keep I, I apologize. I'm like a broken record. Uh, I keep falling back onto ableism because it's so prevalent throughout society, whether you have a disability or you don't, because you you don't have to have a disability to experience ableism. And and that idea that there's only one one type of outcome that's acceptable is problematic. You know, winning at all costs is problematic because sport teaches us so much more. And, you know, Rick talked about the um, Positive Coaching Alliance and it, it's one I'm familiar with too. And they're adjusting their language within their coaching, the words that they use. And language is incredibly powerful when we're talking about something to really get the point across. I mean, when we change from old language to newer language that is focused around making sure that everyone who's participating in the sport is figuring out where they're, where they're successful at and, and what doesn't work for them. And, and then being able to articulate what kind of needs they have of which when something doesn't work for them is essential because mostly athletes have in the past, and they, we still continue to do this is try to push through everything. And, and even if we're, we're not good at one piece of it, just trying to fake it, you know, a little fake it till you make it. And, and that really isn't the type of mentality that's going to be able to give people the opportunity to, to express themselves in sport in a way that's full of joy um, because sport should be fun. It should be joyful. Even, even at the elite level, uh, when I was competing as a Paralympic athlete, if I wasn't having fun with it, if I wasn't enjoying it, I didn't want to do it. And so I had to continue to reevaluate where I was in the sport and then determine what I needed to be able to continue and have joy in the sport or leave the sport. And, and that's not something that most athletes feel like they have the skills to do. And again, I, and I'll reiterate it again, is that I think that within the coaching venues and, and the administration, there has to be a changing of the way that they do things so that athletes learn how to evaluate on their own and understand how they're feeling. Because as athletes, we squash a lot of feelings down to not, not deal with. I mean, I remember I was, um, I was in the Boston Marathon and at the very start of the Boston Marathon, and there was a big crash in the wheelchair division. Lots of us went down. It was in the early eighties. And I thought I was getting through it. Someone hit me from the side. I went down, my tire came off. So someone helped me get my tire back on. We carry CO2 cartridges. So it's like air it up right away and take off. And I raced 26.2 miles, never allowing myself to think about that crash, that frightening, frightening crash. There's pictures of it across the internet. You, you, you Google Boston wheelchair racers crash, and you'll see this. We are splayed out all over the asphalt. And I crossed the finish line and I ended up winning, catching so many people. And I burst into tears because I was so frightened the entire time I was running. That's how strong of a mentality I had and athletes create to push down those emotions. So you can imagine if we're used to pushing our emotions down, then uh, when we come into real life, <laughs> Out of, out, out of sport, we're oftentimes not capable to bring those emotions back up. And then we have dysfunctional and codependent relationships that don't serve any of us. Um, I wanted to address some of the coaching experience that Chamiqua had. Um, you saw at the very, very beginning of the film and there's maybe only one or two shots of him, her high school coach, Coach Canazaro, and we had long talks, you know, off, off camera and on camera. Um, 
And he talked about the, the fact is that there's no real, um, there's no real instruction for people who go into coaching. They go into it for all different reasons. Most of them are, you know, come from athletic and, and, and competitive backgrounds. And without any other construct, they tend to focus on um, winning at all costs and, you know, building physical skills so you can have the edge. But they don't, what, what kids coming up need is they need to be encouraged in life. And a lot of, a lot of kids come to the sports teams, maybe having not such a supportive home life and their coaches become parent figures for them. And to me, it's a, it's a heavy responsibility on coaches that they should embrace to help these kids grow and help these kids deal with difficult situations and not see it, not see their sports thing as, you know, how many wins did we have or did you cause the team to lose? Um, because that's the type of thing that just um, crushes self-esteem and makes people, as you know, as Candace is saying, sports should be fun. And you hear the stories, and if you you know you hear the the you read the autobiographies of people like Andre Agassi, um, tennis player, you know who who talk about how they got turned off to sports at a certain point. They played at an elite level and they came to hate what they were doing. And there's something basically wrong there, whether you're you know, uh, disabled or differently abled or very physically abled. If it's crushing your spirit, there's something inherently wrong in it. So yes, I, I, I would go back to Positive Coaching Alliance there they have a whole, you know, I would encourage people to kind of look at their, um, you know, their materials. And they have these steps to, you know, about how to bring up kids and, and be able to teach life skills. Like you saw a little bit with Shamiqua teaching the, the girls at different points in the, in the film, teaching life skills through sports because it's such an opportunity to do it. And we turn that opportunity on our head all too often by crushing people's spirits. Leroy. Yeah, I, I want to bring it back to, um, to the parents. And, um, you know, I, I also saw in the movie and in, in other examples that sports was a, uh, um, and, and, and escape from going from the life. And um, I, I'm saying that um, parents need to really get involved in the disability justice movement. You know, I, I, I got books out, I got like five books out. But I got this one book called Black Disabled History 101. Now, can you imagine a black um, boy or little girl growing up reading this book, doing sports, and also know that they have a community at home? When, 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 when I got off the plane coming back from the Paralympics, I knew I, I had to go home. And that home was full of you know, love and support, but that almost was activism for black people to try and get their rights and stuff like that. So I knew that I was going back to that. And I think, um, I think pro athletes, you know, try to um, isolate themselves from reality and start to say, okay, Sports is my life. My life sports was was not my life. It was a part of it. But when I got back home, I was like, okay, I'm gonna go back to my activist world. You know, I was an activist. I was protesting, I was writing letters. So, so, so I say those things that you know, the parents have such power. You know, with the children. 
and they need to really um, show their children the whole, the whole, um, the whole life experience. He has his hard, his hardcore. You know, I tell, I tell my niece and nephews, you know, life is not easy. You know, there's going to be problems, but also there's going to be things that, that you can do. And I, I think, you know, seeing that movie, I just wish that the family had more support and more um, more things outside of sports that, that um, she could do. We have a, we got an audience point. I was going to editorialize and say this is particularly true in, um, in professional sports, but, but not necessarily. Coming back to all your comments on coaching, um, someone pushed back and said that's because the coach's livelihood depends on winning. So do address that point. Maybe it's easy to say coaches should be you know, supportive and so on, but um, in a lot of levels, a coach you know, isn't going to get paid to keep that job unless they're winning. Oh, this is Kenneth. So I'll start with that. Like, they could still win um, and also be more conscious about the mindset of the athletes that they're working with. I mean, because there's coaches out there. I had a coach that was really dedicated to the idea of winning, of me being successful and winning, but also wanting to know how I felt about where I was at in my sport and, and what could she do to elevate me? You know, so I, I don't think coaches are going to lose out on, on winning. Should they focus on supporting the athletes and paying attention, right? Being more conscious about what's going on, not just being so driven in the, I don't know, the formation of doing the sport. You know, because it is really about for the athletes, it's about being the sport for a certain amount of time and then learning how to transition out of being that sport. Because when I was a Paralympic athlete for all that time, there was so much of my life wrapped up in it. I mean, at, at one point I was I was sleeping, eating, training, sleeping, eating, <laughs> training, sleeping, eating, training. I didn't have, I didn't have a, a lot of outside activities because I, one, I didn't have a lot of time for them, but there was a lot of loss of community outside of my sport. And I realized I had to make community in my sport. And when I made community in my sport, it involved the coaches also. So I don't, I mean, I understand the question, the, you know, the, the statement that was made, but I don't think it's an all or nothing. I, I don't, I don't think it's that. I think we've thought it was that like, I have to pound on these athletes to get them to be great. And, uh, and I can't focus on anything else. I mean, we're seeing we, and especially throughout the pandemic, we really saw a ramp up of it, of the U S Olympic and Paralympic committee, making sure that their athletes were getting what they needed when they couldn't train and they were getting the psychological support they could get. So they, they created a whole new division within that organization to be able to be available to the athletes and for the athletes to be able to go into therapy and counseling at no cost to them uh, because they raised money to pay for it. The organization raised money to pay for all of this for the athletes to be able to take advantage of it. And so many athletes that I know that competed in Tokyo said that it was a lifesaver for them to have had that, which they would have never thought about on their own, they said, had that presented to them in a package is like, you can take advantage of this. It's not going to cost you anything but your time. And we know it's going to help you because there, there were just so many things. And we saw that during the Olympics being voiced, you know, as Rick was saying about Simone Biles bringing forward, you know, just in that moment during the games where she said, I mentally am not in it. I'm not in it. And, uh, and when an athlete gets to that point, they have a really hard time getting, getting out of it uh, because they start to ruminate on so many different things. It's a, it's a, it's a pretty, um, 
it's a pretty devastating spiral unless you have someone who has taught you how to get out of it. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that Candace makes a lot of good points there. The idea of, I mean, the idea of coaching, whether you're coaching to win or you're coaching the whole person, I think is a very complex one. And I also think it's different at different levels. I think that in, you know, elementary school and, and middle school and even high school, there's really no excuse for a coach to be viewing his job as winning at all costs. There's really no excuse for that. What they should be doing is what the rest of the teachers in elementary school and high school are doing, which is teaching young minds uh, the subject matter and the life skills. That's what you're doing. When it gets to the more competitive, let's say NCAA level, it gets a little bit more complicated, but you still find that, um, and, and even Olympics, you find that the really successful coaches are the ones that do treat the people with respect. And I think the, um, the women's gymnastics team is kind of, uh, you know, case number one in that, you know, when you had Bella Caroli in there as the coach, he was like Mr. Super Coach. And that whole culture imploded. And these young women paid the price of an abusive culture on top of the fact that you literally had, they were being sexually abused. And I think that we, we can see what the costs are. And even when you get to the pro level, um, you get to somebody like Steve Kerr, who coaches the Golden State Warriors, one of the most successful coaches that we have today. And even Greg Popovich is another. And they're, they're looking at the sport much differently than some, some of the other coaches. And they've been successful because they treat the athletes on their team as human beings and they treat them with respect. So I don't think there's a dichotomy between um, you know, coaching to win on the other hand and on one hand and, and coaching uh, you know, the, the total person on the other. I think they're one and the same. And I think athletes on every level are starting to demand it. You even see, like in pro basketball, um, if they feel mistreated by a coach, you know, they get together and they make sure they're traded to, a, to another team. So I think that's, that's a positive thing. But I think it's also important for us to separate the idea that, um, you know, you coach the whole person is a way to to success um so so um so our next question reads um on the intersection of race and disability to what extent do we expect student athletes and professional players of color to play through their injuries despite knowing it will have lifelong consequences Often, this is because we see sports as a way of moving out or moving up. Leo here. I think playing through the injury, it just, it just, I mean, it shortens your, your, your um, athlete record. You know, because you're playing through, uh, through the injury, and you're going to come back. So, you know, I, I would say, you know, take a stand with your coach and say, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to really heal this injury so I can play longer. And that's, and that's, you know, it might, athletes might be scared of it, you know, it, they don't want to be treated, but what's 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 our answer? Our answer is if you're gonna play and you might you know shorten your career because you might re injure and re injure and never and never you know get that healing that that you need. So once again, athletes need to really. 
step up. I, is, is, there, is there like a union for athletes? I think it has to do like a union for athletes. Because that's, that's, another thing, that's another thing I see. The athletes have very little rights when, when, when it comes to, you know, taking a stand. Um, against the coach or against the owner, um, you know, I was in, I was involved with uh, this um, um, blog radio. He's one of the top um, sports um, reporters in in the world. I love his radio show. I just forget his name. But, you know, he's a political radio producer. And he, he, he always says, it's like, what, where is the union for athletes? Where is the athletes' rights? If the athletes don't have rights, then there's, there's no sports. So, so that's, that's my thing. I think the athletes really need to step up and really, I know, I know they have been, you know, since you know, taking the knee and all of this, but I think I think the sports arena in general needs to change drastically. I, I think Lee makes a, a really good point about that, that it that the athletes need to step up and kind of demand rights. I also see that the cultures are changing. It's mm -hmm. slow, but I think of, you know, the, the issue of injuries um, or mental illness as being kind of akin, uh, uh, akin to mental, uh, uh, to healthcare in general, that it ought to be a partnership between if, if, if it's medical care, like the doctor and the patient, or if, uh, or, or if it's an athlete, you know, the athlete and the organization or the athlete and the coach, really, the athlete and the medical staff, because athletes are driven to um, many and, you know, uh, I'm sure many of you to play through injuries, mm -hmm. to, you know, gut it out. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but these are judgment calls. And the athlete has to be center of that judgment call in partnership with people who are looking out for them. And again, they can't be um, short-term goals that push them back onto the field if there's a championship at stake. It has to be, um, you know, it has to be taken. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I'd like to hear from others. I think that that sort of culture is changing even if, even if it's maybe a slow change. Yeah, you know, one of the things I really appreciated about your film is the story of vulnerability that was told throughout the film. You know, throughout those times that we're experiencing, there was a lot of work to hide the vulnerability, but the story being told in the film showed a vulnerability to voice it for the film. And and I felt that that was really, really important because whether it's a, you know, an emotional injury or a physical injury um, or a mental health condition, any of those types of things, the athletes oftentimes, and we see this throughout the disability community too, for people who have non-apparent disabilities, ones we can't see, is to hide it to try to hide it and, and not bring it forward, which then begins to create this, um, this uh, um, internalized feeling that you have to hide a lot of things uh, to be able to get what you need. And, and I think that that also uh, speaks to code switching that we hear about from, that people do. I know as a disabled person, oftentimes, I need help with things and I have to, not that I'm not a nice person, but I think I'm kind of nice, but I have to be really nice to get what I need, even though I don't want to be nice because what I need should be done. 
<laughs> like it should be done already. I shouldn't have to ask for it, but I have to ask for it, you know? And so with athletes, I think it's quite similar in so many ways uh, because they're, they're, they're weighing, you know, okay, what are my odds on this? And what are my odds on that? And, you know, and then we see athletes really, um, you know, and Leroy talked about it as Rick that they push themselves beyond um, when they should have stopped. And, uh, and, and then the coming back is so much harder. I, I, I had one instance where I overtrained and an individual's body gets to a point where it's diminishing returns. <laughs> and I am not getting faster when I should be getting faster. And my mind is telling me uh, inappropriately that I should work harder. Now I need to work harder because I'm not getting faster. And in reality, I was getting overtrained and I was going backwards when my mind was telling me I had to keep going forward. And fortunately I had a coach that was watching my progress and said, I think we need to make you stop, like literally stop and, and just rest for a period of time. And the mind is no way I'm going to fall so far behind. Are you kidding me? I can't stop. I can't stop. And so that mentality is really prevalent in sports throughout. And, and it's, it's quite problematic because it's based off of, you know, some of our external sources of, of oppression and stigma, but also, um, again, I'm going to go back to ableism, that, that idea that there's, there's one way to be healthy. Yeah, all I want to say very quickly is that um, I, I do re remember um, the broadcast. It's a day with Zion because the heads of sports and it's a wonderful political sports um, broadcast, one, one of the best. And I think, I think that, I think also, it just really to me likes to talk to themselves because it is more comfortable. We need to get, you know, this conversation in, you know, other places. You know, sports, sports illustrated, you know, should have this, you know. I'm so glad that Dave Zion, you know, brought me on to his podcast and really talked about, you know, the Paralympics during the, um, you know, um, during COVID, you know, and really talk about that. But, you know, they, these kind of conversations need to go a lot further than just, you know, the disability community. And I think, I think um, now because of inclusionary policy, it's finally opening up these, um, these, doors that should have been open since the 70s. But anyway, these doors are finally opening up, so we need to really walk through them, through them and educate, you know, quote unquote, the mainstream society about these kind of issues. Um, we, we're going to hit our 10 minute mark here. Um, so a couple things, you have a couple questions uh, in the hopper. Um, one was actually specific to, uh, to Rick about the WNBA and NBA, NBA supporting the film. We see they've, they've got it on their mm -hmm. websites. Are they, are they doing it enough, quite frankly? And then um, let, let's leave that. And I know Ajahn has got a question. Well, we, we did have, uh, we made an agreement with uh, the NBA, oh, maybe two or three years after the release of the film. And they had... Um, I can't remember exactly the term, but it's kind of like a mind body web page for, for the NBA and the NBA family, meaning all the athletes there, but also, you know, the, the wider NBA uh, system and fans. And so we have, we um, put together something with the Jed Foundation, which is uh, an organization out of New York that does a lot of good mental, mental health work um, and kind of chopped up our film into little episodes that people could access with, you know, with questions. In other words, an interactive page. 
so the NBA in that way was, you know, supportive of, of what we were doing. Um, and, you know, and the WNBA as well. The WNBA is part, actually, structurally is part of the NBA, um, the, uh, one large organization. So that, that's been a positive for us. And we've also um, gotten, um, you know, somewhat of a partnership with NCAA, not on an official level, but a lot of the sports psychologists who are involved with top, um, you know, some of the top conferences in the, in the NCAA, um, we've been working back and forth with them on making this accessible to, you know, their community of, you know, sports psychologists, but also the medical teams and the coaches and stuff like that. So that that's that's a real positive for us. And we're trying to move that ahead uh, more and more each year. Awesome. OK, so this uh, this last question is for our Paralympians. Um, do you feel that the Paralympic Committee and Olympic Committee are doing enough to address mental health? Um, this cast, oh. this, this short. Um, oh, go ahead, Garrison. OK, you sure you want to go first? I don't mind. I, you can go. No, first. no, go. All right. Well, one of the things I know, well, with para powerlifting, we do meet with our sports psychologists at least two to three times a month. So I think that's a start and it's a requirement that we meet with our sports psychologist in my particular sport. I don't not sure for other sports. So I think that's one of the a, a very positive step because we get access to an individual that we can share what's going on currently, not only in our training, but in our personal lives, because I, people don't realize that your personal life has a great effect on your training and you cannot train optimally if you under, you know, intense stress and things of that nature. It also causes injuries. So, you know, we keep a very open communication. Um, at least I do. I'm not sure about my other teammates, but at least I do. I keep an open communication. So that way, you know, if anything arises, you know, she might be able to tell my trainer or I, she might inform me to tell my trainer like, hey, you might want to change his program up, the intensity, because right now he got a lot on his mind or he's under a lot of stress at work or whatever the case may be. At least we have an option, you know, and I think in the past, you know, a lot of athletes, you know, it wasn't a requirement to speak with a sports psychologist. So, you know, that's a good thing. I think the Paralympic movement is doing an Olympic movement as well. So hopefully in every sport they have to meet with a sports psychologist as a requirement on a routinely basis. Yeah, this is Candace. And I would say that, um, so when I was competing, it, there was no opportunity that was afforded us to be able to have that kind of support that Garrison was just talking about. And it's, and it has changed, mm -hmm. which is really great. And, and it's, they're continuing to build it. And as I said before, during the pandemic, they really instituted a whole new division because they understood that they were not keeping up with what the need was. And, and also there was, um, as Rick had talked about, the women's gymnastics lawsuits that had come forward and all of those disclosures. And, and so I believe that the US Olympic and Paralympic Committee here, the national governing body for Olympic and Paralympic sport for the United States is doing the work they need to do to step it up. It's not enough yet. It's definitely not enough because the lots of athletes still don't realize that it's available. Um, and they're not taking, you know, they're not taking advantage of it when they really should, because the mindset is a integral part of, of a physical athletic performance. It, you know, you have to have the two together working yeah. in a symbiotic relationship. Uh, it's a, it's the, uh, the perfection of co-creation, I think. And, and so I think outside of Paralympic sport, um, within the International Olympic Committee and the International Paralympic Committee, those two groups are beginning to work together more and more in other areas but not uh, anything that I'm seeing in the mental health area. I see the International Olympic Committee uh, doing more than the International Paralympic Committee uh, in that space, but 
uh, again, I'm, I'm not in that space a lot. So I'm just looking from the outside, what I read in the news and the newsletters and things. And so I think, uh, you know, with the International Paralympic Committee, one of the areas that they're hoping to be able to then elevate this narrative is part of the We the 15 campaign, which is a 10 year decade long campaign to uh, educate, but also, you know, influence and integrate people with disabilities on all levels in all aspects of society and get the world to know that disability is not a negative thing. It's not a bad thing. It's a human life experience that we're all going to have. And sport is a really wonderful way to elevate in different ways. Leroy, take us home. Yeah, I want to leave you off because, you know, we're talking about mental health, but there's a lot of mental health organizations that, that are not doing good work. We, we, we have to really pick out the mental health organizations that, that are controlled by people with mental health. You know, a lot of people go to, to the national organization. Please don't. You know, do your research, Google, and find radical mental health that, that, that is controlled by people with mental health and people that are activists. Because if you rely on national organizations, they're not going to give you what, what really needs to be done. And, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm an activist, so, you know, I, I get to know the, the real organizations that are doing real breakthrough work, you know, and separate those with organizations that get the money that are not doing the work, so. Excellent, thank you. That's gonna take us to our time. So Real Abilities Los Angeles wants to thank all of our panelists for that vital discussion on sports, mental health and disability. Mind Game filmmaker, Rick Goldsmith, Paralympian and Disability Commissioner, Candace Cable, founder of Crip Hop Nation and Paralympian Leroy Moore, and namesake of the Garrison Red Project and Paralympian Garrison Red. Thank you so much. Now we're gonna take a quick break. Thank you. You're very welcome. We are gonna take a quick break, everybody that's, uh, that's still on if you're interested, and I hope you are, because we're gonna come back on this same Zoom link in just 10 minutes at 5, 10 p.m. Pacific for our Schmoo Zoom with actor activist, Danny Woodburn and Crip Camp's Jim Lebrecht, so you can speak directly with them about accessibility in Hollywood. See you all there. Thank you.